everyone. Uh, welcome back to those of you who were here this morning. And, and if anybody uh, is joining us new, you missed a really great morning. So <laughs> sorry. Um, and one of the things you might have missed uh, was an incredible introductory poem invocation from our Barnstable High School student over here, Kaylee Magnus. <laughs> Maybe an encore at the end. What do we think? Encore at the end? Yeah, OK. Yes, yes, encore at the end. I am serious at the end, so just practice. <laughs> but meanwhile, you can, you can read it for yourself. So I just wanted to point out that for anybody who missed them in the poster session, there are copies of the poem that you heard this morning. And there's going to be some extra ones because we ran out um, at the uh, coffee break um, downstairs. And then um, just so that uh, you don't forget, if you stay through the whole afternoon and it won't be too long and it'll be just as great as the fantastic morning, then you get to go to the reception, which is again with the poster, so you'll have another chance um, to think about education and to have some lovely snacks. <laughs> so now, if you remember, we had life, we had earth, and we had space. So we're up to earth. And um, we actually have a, a, a discussant, Canaveri, Valentius, whose name I can never say right on the first try, even though we've known each other for quite a while. Um, and uh, Nate Holtman will be our speaker. And let me just tell you a little bit about each of them, because we're going to let Nate talk, and then Canaveri is going to guide a discussion. And then, again, the floor will be open up uh, for questions from the audience. So Canaveri and I met when we were Radcliffe Fellows a couple of years ago. And I was very confused as to whether or not she was a scientist, a historian, a historian of science, or just an incredibly interesting person. And she's actually all of those things. Um, so she is a professor at Boston College, and she studies environmental history, the history of science and medicine, American energy, and the US Civil War. It's a very normal combination. Um, and so you can, as I said this morning, you can read her full bio um, in the program, and I'll just point out that she is an alum. Her PhD is from Harvard in the history of science. We have many alums here today, and if I pointed them all out, I would take too much time. Sorry. And uh, Nate Holtman, Holt, Holtman, who is our first uh, speaker today, is currently, <coughs> excuse me, the director of the Center for Global Sustainability and an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. And um, you may have noticed in the program, or you may have noticed from his work, that Nate also was in the White House, um, not the current White House. Um, he was there from 2014 to 2016, and his specialty is uh, climate and energy policy. So again, 2014 to 2016. Um, <laughs> And uh, anyway, so he's going to talk to us about the role of the undiscovered in his subject areas. And then, as I mentioned, Conover will have a discussion with him, and then it will be open to the audience. So thank you. And take it away, Nate. So this is a symposium about the undiscovered, what we don't know. Uh, and we've heard a couple of uh, talks this morning that elaborate on the concept and that have provided us a couple of really exciting examples of how, in science, thinking about technology, we can expand the way we look at things and think new, different thoughts about what might be out there. But unfortunately, when it comes to climate change, there is a ghastly certainty in the science of what we know about the climate changes that the planet will witness an absence of a dramatic near-term action to retool our global economy. It's a message that none of us want to hear, but it is the clear-eyed reality of our situation. This is a graphic representation of global temperature changes from 1880 to 2015. It provides a striking illustration of the increase of temperatures over time, and the accelerating pace of new high temperature records. Of course, climate change is more complex than this. It's not just temperatures. Um, and we've been studying as a scientific community, and certainly in broader communities such as my own and policy, trying to think about how to capture and understand some of the problems inherent in climate change for many decades now. A few weeks ago, this knowledge was synthesized in a, a report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I suspect many of you at least have heard about. 
This report synthesized thousands of papers on our scientific understanding of the likely impacts of climate change under different levels of warming. The report concludes that even an additional one degree of warming from where we are today by 2030 could expose hundreds of millions of people to dangerous climate risks stemming from extreme temperatures, floods, rising sea levels, and more. It would endanger ecosystems and threaten species with extinction. It would likely wipe out 99% of the remaining coral reefs on our planet. And that is for one additional degree from today to warming of roughly two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Without rapid new action, we could be on course to a warming of up to four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which is a change that is similar in magnitude to the difference between the depths of the last ice age and today. And we know all this with significant confidence. In fact, most of the scientific unknowns, most but not all, cut the wrong way. Do we have less time? Are we underestimating the important feedbacks or tipping points? And might it be more severe than we thought up to now? The report also assessed what social and technological transitions would be needed to avoid these severe outcomes and asserts that a window is open just to keep warming to roughly one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels in a way that is good news, in a way. But the sobering message is also that radical transformations need to happen in our energy and social systems on a very, very short timeline. That timeline is about a dozen years. By 2030, 12 years from now, we need to have reduced global CO2 emissions by roughly 60% from today's levels and to reach roughly zero net carbon emissions by 2050, or 32 years from today. And while that transition is already underway, I'm reminded of the Marie Curie quote about we don't look at what's behind us, we always look at what's in front of us. We are already on the transition path. That transition is happening, and I'll return to that later. But nevertheless, it needs to accelerate at an unprecedented scale and pace from where we are today. So that brings up today this undiscovered question of can we do it? First, let's get a sense for what that scale and pace of reductions really might look like. The left figure here is actually from that IPCC report. It's a schematic diagram, which is sort of cartoonish. But what you see on the left is from roughly 1970 to 2020, the path of current global emissions, followed by two simplified pathways to reaching zero net emissions by mid-century, which is, again, what we know uh, we'll need to do. The rapidity of those changes should be obvious from just looking at the chart. Um, the table on the right provides some rough guidelines or some rough estimates for the degree of change we need to see between now and 2030 and 2050. Take coal, for example. Coal use needs to decrease by roughly 60 to 80 percent by 2030 and by nearly 100 percent by 2050. We need roughly 60 percent of electricity to come from renewables by 2030. And in some scenarios, we would need well in excess of 500 billion tons of CO2 to be captured and stored underground between now and 2100 using a technology that has not yet been deployed at any kind of scale. So clearly we're talking at nothing less than complete shutdown of the fossil fuel system in, in, in the world's economy over the next roughly 30 years. It is a daunting task, but like any task, we can take some steps to ask what we know, what we don't know about what that transition might look like. So we do have some idea of what needs to happen and what that might look like. It turns out that such transitions have been studied for decades now by modelers, policymakers, scientists, technology experts, and many others. And there are a few consistent features across almost all scenarios that keep climate change to minimum levels. So first, you can see here, uh, on energy system, you use less energy. It's energy efficiency, okay? That's a core pillar of what we need to do. So all the technologies that use less energy and use it more efficiently are core and central to this particular one. The second piece is you decarbonize all of our electricity. In other words, take all of the electricity we generate now and make it from renewable or clean sources of some kind, no carbon emitting sources. And then finally, you look at anything possible that you can use electricity to do and you switch over from fossil fuels to electricity for all those applications. 
Okay, so those are the pillars on the energy side. And then there's a few other things. You have to think about how to absorb carbon in land sinks, and to some degree, oceans might be part of this as well. Um, you have to think about carbon removal technologies, maybe, in other words, negative emissions from the atmosphere, uh, removing them using energy and, and sequestering them underground. And then thinking, and this is where some creativity comes in, thinking about where we can make substitutions. What can we do differently about how we organize our lives and our societies that can change the practices from one sort of technological strategy to another? And this I actually uh, was, was inspired by um, the keynote speech today where we heard about the debacle, right? The breaking up, where you break it up and you reorganize the pieces and you think about things that are different. So I'll return to that in a later slide. So we do have an idea of what needs to happen. Um, these are some characteristics about the coming transition that we are pretty confident about. What we're not sure about is how we operationalize the rapid pace of reductions with what I would call the gummy, imperfect, and sometimes intractable social systems that we have. In part, some of that's unknowable, but in part, uh, we can look to some other examples to give us some ideas. So I'll review some perspectives on transitions uh, of the past and what we know about the transition that we might need to undertake to see what, what, if we can illuminate both what might be possible and then how we might organize ourselves to go about doing it. So I'm going to say four different points on this. So first, there have been rapid transitions in technologies before. Okay, so we all under, understand the concept of it used to be you know, generally uh, you know, horse and carriage and we're now using automobiles. So these trend transition in technologies is a, is a fundamental issue and we know that those transitions happen more quickly or can happen quickly. This particular figure shows a number of different technological transitions in the United States from 1800, sorry, 1880, um, all the way up to 2010. And you don't need to sp spend a lot of time looking at each individual curve, but the concept here is that this shows a curve showing early adopters all the way up to kind of essentially full deployment in the US economy by percentage of households. And you can see on the left side you have telephones, electricity, on the right side you have things like cell phone uh, and the internet. So what we're seeing, first of all, is that te technologies do transition, and the question is can we make that transition happen more quickly? So let me ask a question. How many of you in this room own a smartphone? Okay, I should ask how many don't, but, but okay. Okay, so the point is how many of you remember that in June 2007, there was no such thing as an app or an iPhone. Okay. And this is where we are today. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a familiar example to many of you. Um, roughly 66% of people in the US now own a smartphone, 36% of people globally. Here's another example, automobiles, I mentioned before. Here's a picture of New York Fifth Avenue in 1900. If you see, there's a little red circle around the single automobile on the street at that time. All the rest are horse-drawn carriages. 13 years later, this is the same scene, to the day. Essentially 100% penetration of automobiles in that particular part of the world. Okay, that, now, that's one part of the world. It's not indicative of the whole country. For the whole country, went from roughly 1% in 1900 to 99% automobiles by 2030. And this happens across a lot of different kinds of technologies. There have been rapid transitions before. One you might not be familiar with because it happened in Brazil was a transition from traditional vehicles to vehicles that can use either ethanol or gasoline called flex fuel vehicles. That particular transition happened in the 2000s, roughly 5% of sales in 2003 to over 90% of sales in 2009. Okay, five years to kind of essentially almost full, uh, almost full deployment on the sales so the point there is that we can see rapid transitions in technologies. I should caveat, these are all contingent. They're all specific to the, the local circumstances. They have a lot of uh, contingencies as to whether they can work or not. We have to think about how those really worked in practice and think about how we can apply it into the future. I'm not saying it's just gonna magically happen. Second, on the transition perspectives, we have had broad mobilization before. And in fact, that IPCC report calls out one specific example which many of you are probably thinking about when I use the term mobilization, which is World War II, okay? So in World War II, defense expenditure rose from roughly $2 billion in 1940 to $91 billion four years later. That increase is equivalent to $1 trillion in current dollars in four years. 
The U.S. produced about 40% of the world's armaments over that time, including 300,000 airplanes, 100,000 ships, much, much more. And we increased our workforce by 7.7, almost 8 million people. Okay, people that hadn't been in the civilian workforce before had entered the civilian workforce. And you can see an example of one of those people in the poster here. Um, obviously an icon for the fact that women were moving uh, much more broadly into the workforce. So that's an example. It's called out even by the IPCC report. We know that happened in one specific country under one specific set of circumstances. We know that that level of mobilization will likely have to happen over the next 15 years. So the real question is, how can we do that, right? How can we make that happen on a global scale? The third perspective I want to share on this is tying back to the theme of today, which is that our thinking has often been wrong. And we learn from it, but it has often been wrong. I'm going to give just two examples, although there are many. Uh, there are many here. Think back to the 1970s. In the middle of the 1970s, there was an oil crisis. There were a lot of smart people trying to figure out what energy demand would look like in the United States to try to plan for it. This figure shows a number of different forecasts from that period of energy demand. You can, I don't know if you can see the scale. It's 1975 to 2000 was the projection period. And like I said, a lot of the smartest people, so, so we think, were doing these, uh, doing these projections. So if you were looking at this, you might say, well, OK, probably somewhere in the middle. What the actual amount of demand was, was at the very bottom end of that envelope. In other words, the economy did much better on efficiency uh, than people had anticipated. Okay? So people, in aggregate, were quite wrong about where we were headed. And they were wrong in, a, in a some way. We, we kind of came out better than people thought uh, at that point. Here's another example. This one's a little harder to follow. But what I want you to see here is that this is a set of solar forecasts over a period of roughly 10 years from a single organization, the International Energy Agency. Of course, we'd presume that people would be, you know, we're, we're certainly much smarter now, of course, and we have better models and all these things. We've learned all from our, all our mistakes. But what this shows is that we actually didn't. Um, each of those colored bars shows a forecast from a, a subsequent year. So the forecast started out very low for what solar would look like, and they increasingly got higher. And if you see the dotted line there, the dotted line at the very upper end of that envelope is where solar deployment actually happened. So the solar deployment was way faster, way faster than the International Energy Agency predicted. Okay, so each of these years, the forecasts increase, and they were always lagging by a significant amount from where reality really was. Okay, so very far behind in terms of thinking about solar deployment in, 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 uh, uh, globally. And by the way, it's not just IEA. There's been studies of this. There's been lots of other uh, organizations made the same uh, error in judgment. So the point there is that when we think about the future, when we think about what's possible, we often think about kind of drawing extrapolations from where we were today and not thinking about what can happen uh, under different circumstances. This has happened in energy demand, as I just showed. It's happened in EVs. It's happened in photovoltaics. It's happened in wind. And it's happened in batteries, among many others, that we've been surprised by the rate of change, even with smart people thinking about where it might actually end up. The fourth piece I want to mention is that we are actually, right now, in the middle of a revolution in clean energy. Like, we need to be aware of that. We need to acknowledge that's what's happening and be open to that. Um, I use the word revolution not flipply. Like, I think it's actually really important that we're considering what the implications of that are, but it's, it actually is happening. Currently, onshore winds or traditional wind turbines are one of the most competitive sources for new generation, coming in at roughly three cents a kilowatt hour. That's at the very low end of what fossil uh, can, can generate. Um, solar photovoltaic, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, has been quite surprising over the last decade. Um, the figure here shows a long, longer term decrease from 1975 to 2007 in the orange on price and a corresponding dramatic increase of photovoltaic deployment on the right in the bluish color. Costs have fallen 73%, roughly 80% uh, over the last decade. Um, over the last six years, more money was invested in renewable energy than has been invested in new fossil generation. So that's a significant outcome. $280 billion last year was invested in renewables globally, outstripping the amount we spent on all fossil generation investments. And finally, the International Renewable Energy Agency does estimate, with all the cost drops we're seeing, that renewable energy will consistently be cheaper than most fossil fuels in every part of the world by 2020. Okay, so for new generation, we have the opportunities 
to deploy these new kinds of technologies without, you know, kind of radical sort of thinking about, well, we have to pay tons more somehow to, in order for ha to have this happen. Now, there are other challenges techn you know, technically about sort of deploying renewables at fast scale and at rapid rates. I don't want to minimize those, but the point is that we have the tools right now at our disposal to do a rapid deployment. So what do we, you know, those are, those are some observations from the past, from the present, about so, some perspectives on what this transition might look like. But there are still some elements that we still don't know what to do. We don't know how to go about it. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves that we need to be thinking creatively and differently about some of this stuff. Um, the IPCC report that I mentioned earlier does mention that the rates of changes that, uh, that we do need to see have occurred in the past. So that's what I was essentially reflecting to you. Within specific sectors, within specific technologies, within specific spatial context, but there is no documented historical precedent for their scale. So it's the scaling question and the social organization question that really is at the heart of this particular, quest, this particular problem. So this problem, I, I, I want to split up into a couple of components. In one of the earlier talks, we heard about the fact that there's individual components of a system, and then there's a system thinking. Part of the individual components of our system will, of course, be the technologies that we use to deliver the services we need. And we know that there are many such technologies at our fingertips right now. Many of you will recognize a number of electric vehicles. These are existing electric vehicles today. Um, we have batteries that we can deploy, battery storage. We have drone delivery, very importantly. We have uh, drone delivery of Domino's pizzas, which is shown here. Um, we have uh, autonomous vehicles, which are increasingly uh, being tested and, and deployed uh, and will likely be deployed at scale in the, in the relatively near term. Uh, we have offshore wind turbines that are, uh, some of them are anchored, some of them are not, but increasingly deployed globally. We have magnetic levitation trains that have been demonstrated. We have carbon capture and sequestration, which has been demonstrated and commercialized. And we even have, and this is one of the uh, sort of more different kinds of technologies you might think of, meatless burgers, which could in fact be a significant contributor to the change in carbon emissions on, from our agricultural sector. We also have technologies that are, you know, there's not a bright line between these, but that are kind of concept technologies. We have technologies that we can actually use to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequester it in the ground or in solid materials. We have Elon Musk's Hyperloop, which I'm sure some of you have read about. Um, we have small modular nuclear reactors, which might be proliferation resistant ways to get low carbon energy. Um, we also have the ever possible uh, option of nuclear fusion, which people continue to work on and may well come through one of these days, uh, but it's not, you know, it could happen. Um, and then finally, we have our familiar unknown unknowns, right? So we have in, in technology, as you all know, there's always discoveries, we're always finding new things. Many of those things are hard to predict from where we stand today that may still make a big difference in, say, 2030 or 2040. And that's one area where many of you, particularly I'm looking at the, the, the young people in the audience, might be able, with your scientific inquiries, your scientific interest, your technological skills that you're building right now, be able to kind of grab onto some idea that you might have and, ma and make that uh, into a reality that, that really does help the world. But like I said, it's not just the technologies, right? The technologies are a piece of the puzzle, but they're not the system. So we have to think about the broader systemic approaches that we can take, reorganizing ourselves, okay? Reorganizing ourselves, that mobilization, which includes technology, but also includes organizations, governance, personal choices, and more. And this is where we have to be creative, and this is in some ways where, where it is uh, somewhat unknown. Um, this is a, a diagrammatic depiction of blockchain, which some of you may be familiar with, but people have talked about blockchain as a way that we can potentially use distributed, uh, distributed energy sources and distributed storage within the context of a smart grid, which is the, the diagram on the right, um, to actually build out these technologies at a much more rapid pace and allow people to get paid for it um, as they go. There's also food waste is another way to think about it. Some people have worked on food waste. Food waste actually accounts for something like a third of the food that produced globally today is wasted. It accounts for something like five to 7% of global uh, GHG emissions just from the waste. So there's a way that we can reuse the food that we were already throwing away uh, or use less of it. Those kinds of uh, approaches are, are gonna be essentially important. 
And then finally, one that's probably more familiar is retooling and rethinking how we do our work and how we do our transportation and living situations, right? So can we telework? Can we do other modes of engaging with uh, our, our workplaces, but also with each other um, that ideally are uh, more personally fulfilling, uh, less greenhouse gas emissions, and also maybe uh, better for our health. So we can track that with the, our health tracker. Um, one example that I want to give on organizing strategies, we are now running an experiment in the United States. Okay, a year and a half ago, Donald Trump announced his intent to pull out of the Paris Agreement on climate change. Some of you may have heard that when it happened. Within 72 hours of that announcement, a coalition of 2,700 city, states, and businesses stepped up to say, we are still in. We are still committed to the goals of the Paris Agreement. That group is called We Are Still In, and they've been working with a group that I'm affiliated with called America's Pledge, led by Michael Bloomberg and Jerry Brown, to think about how we can organize ourselves differently at different levels of governance to accelerate what otherwise would have happened in this country. So that coalition, which is depicted graphically here, is now over 3,500 uh, 3, strong. It um, represents over half the US population, and it represents over uh, almost 60% of US GDP. So were it a country, it would be the world's third largest economy and the world's fourth largest greenhouse gas emitter. So I'm gonna say two more things about this topic. The first one is that we can choose our future, right? The future that we have is not just sort of pain and suffering, it's very much kind of a positive story of benefits and health. So first of all, there's an estimate that we could benefit by $26 trillion with this low carbon investment up to 150 million premature deaths avoided due to uh, reduced air pollution. And finally, subsidy reform and carbon pricing that would put an, another roughly $3 trillion into government revenues uh, by 2030, which is over uh, the, the GDP of India. So finally, the answer is that can we do it? And the answer is yes, we can under four specific uh, kind of possibilities. First of all, to improve the odds, we have to think about funding technology R&D and fostering demand with the private sector. Second, we have to build this into the economy by investing in new green infrastructure, pricing carbon, and disclosing risk. We have to reorganize ourselves, as I mentioned, acting at all levels of government, using governance and policy as a way to focus our responses. And finally, and this is where I want to link into the earlier comments that were made at the front end of the session, is to embrace our humanity. This is a broad economic opportunity, but some people will be, have to be displaced. And so we have to think about making sure that the politics and the transition strategy works for all people and not just some. Um, and with that, I will conclude and, and say thanks very much and we can go to questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think this is also a good moment for us to send a shout out to all those watching on live stream. Because as we think about creative ways to replace travel, right, and especially plane driven travel, with other forms of virtual presence, uh, you know, we need to get better at stuff like, yeah, I'm gonna log into that conference now, right? And the Radcliffe, I think, has really been leading the way on that. So thank you. I wanna push us all now. I don't know if I'll push Nate so much, but I wanna push us, because this is a science conference on the undiscovered. And I wanna talk a little bit, of, or ask a bit, about some of the pieces that I think can be undiscovered in our conversations about science policy. I would like, very briefly, for you to, us to talk to us about God. And the room goes quiet, right? Because that's what happens in scientific discussions when we ask about faith. So what are the, you talked about the need for uh, social, this, this is not a, as much, or not solely a science question as it is a scaling question and a social organization question. Can you talk to us about the ways in which communities of faith can, can and are being mobilized around climate change? Sure. Um, so first of all, it is a great question. Um, I, I don't know if I can answer the deep questions about God, but I can say, um, I can say that your, your, your last point about broader engagement across different communities, different organizations is going to be essential. If we're thinking about organizing our, let me, let me back up. A lot of people have framed up the climate question many times as a question of sort of consumer choice, which is very important by the way. It is important to kind of choose green energy, you know, do all those things. But it, it, it cannot be just consumer choice. We have to organize ourselves to do these transitions in a, in a deliberate way. And what we all have right now, somebody earlier in the, in, in this, uh, in, in the, in the symposium used the, the lovely term, um, find your own tide pool. Okay? So find your own way to kind of 
Use, the, use the, the world that you're in, use the sphere that you're in. Try to think creatively about what can be done within that sphere. And it's vitally important to use those spheres that we're already operating in to maximize how we can work with those communities. And so the communities of faith, the communities of, I talked about city, state, local governments, right? That's one way to organize. Communities of faith is another, universities is another. Uh, you all can probably think of many other ways to kind of organize ourselves. And long ago, the climate question moved from a science and technology question primarily to a question of ethics, values, and social organizing and action, okay? And that's where we are today. It's, it spans the spectrum. And so the question for us is sort of how do you link those, those, how do you make the links between all those dimensions? And yes, I think using, you know, making sure we recognize that there are deep values and what we're, choices we're making over the next couple of years is an essential uh, piece of the answer here. Mm. Excellent, okay. I'll just ask you one more and then we'll open it up. So please be thinking, be brewing your excellent questions, please. Um, so the crudest way I would put my next question is, so what, what makes this not just a white people question, mm -hmm. right? And I, every time I talk about this in an elite university context, I think about that, right? How do we open up, how do we make the we really a we, mm -hmm. right? And you showed us a map of the organizations that are part of America's Pledge and that we're still in, and that's a pretty geographically sp spread out map. What are the ways in which you see action that is useful, that is taking that is moving the needle on climate change that is geographically, ethnically, socioeconomically diverse and inclusive? Yeah. It's a great question. I, I don't have a full answer to it because I think that's actually something that we need creativity and, and, and energy for, uh, to help us answer collectively. Um, I do think that part of, the, part of the discussion here has to focus on, again, what are the actual benefits? Like, what are we actually getting from this transition? We are choosing uh, in this, I think, a better path. Like we are choosing a cleaner, uh, cleaner air, we're choosing better health, we're choosing uh, more jobs, and those kinds of discussions are really what ought to be at the core of how we discuss amongst ourselves and discuss much more broadly uh, the benefits and the strategies of doing the transition. So here's where we can go, not just we need to eat our vegetables, mm -hmm. right, about giving things up. Oh, excellent, very nice. I would like to invite now people to come up and ask a question. A great writer once wrote in a book that I occasionally um, wave at my students, vigorous writing is concise. Mm -hmm. I would add that so is vigorous question asking. So would you come up please and state your name and uh, ask a question of our speaker. Hi, I'm, I'm Tanya Vartevian. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could also um, talk a little about the role of natural preservation in, in helping slow down climate change. And that also seems to be the apropos your last question, that, that that would also be something that would help everyone of any race or color or economic situation. Good. The answer is absolutely. There's, there's a lot of reasons to preserve natural areas and to kind of in, encourage sort of uh, um, uh, continued growth of this, those natural ecosystems, even in this country, in the United States. Uh, be partly because of climate change, partly because of other reasons, we're expecting some of the, uh, essentially the carbon sequestration to be tapering off over the next couple of decades without further uh, kind of conservation efforts. So it's gonna be an, a key part of it, um, and I think it can happen in different ways in different countries, but um, it's, it's gotta be at the core of how we approach it. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emily Oman from Barnstable High School, and I have a question. So. We do so many movements, like for instance, the removing plastic straws movement. We try to bring about change, but it always feels like big businesses or business practices in general kind of try to suppress that when they see the short-term profit or they see it as a problem to their business. Yeah, so that's a, that's a- So how do you like, how do you think that you will overcome that? Yeah. I think that's part of what we have to think about, okay? So, so one of the, you know, there are individual strategies that can be taken, but as I mentioned in some of my framing comments, you know, we're talking about a pretty radical transformation that a number of industries will be directly affected by. And so, you know, that, that sort of, that strategy has to include the specific kinds of targeted efforts like perhaps you've been involved in, and those are, those are really important to continue doing, um, and I commend you for kind of doing it. On the other hand, it also takes other kinds of social, like when I talked about organizing ourselves, I do mean policy, right? Like you, partly, it's not the only thing, but 
policy has to be part of this. And then finally, there's a, another piece that I didn't really address in the talk, but that is about attitudes. And that it's, you know, attitudes can also flip quite quickly in, in our society. And I don't think, I think people study it, but we still don't understand all the drivers behind what actually forces attitudes to, or it catalyzes attitudes to change. And that's something where um, I'm hoping, you know, you guys from, from Barnstable, as you're doing your work and you're grabbing onto these, uh, onto these issues, you can help with that. Uh, that shift in attitudes um, and with the energy and the, and the hopefully impatience that you have about uh, getting something done. We did get rid of plastic bags. There you go. <laughs> and can I just add that some of us are old enough to remember when any gathering of human beings of this size would be, the room would be completely filled with a layer of cigarette smoke, mm. right? And that no longer occurs. I mean, that, and that was a rapid shift, mm -hmm. so. Um, my name is Skylar Bowman. I'm also from Barnstable High School. And my dad is someone who kind of believes that climate change isn't a serious issue. He seems to think that nature will balance itself out. And I try to talk to him, like I, I'll share research with him and data and he, he'll tell me either that, you know, that I don't know what I'm saying or that I've been brainwashed by liberals. And um, so I was wondering if you had any advice on how I can talk to him and people like him and yeah. explain that it is a serious issue. Yeah. Once again, I, th I thank you guys for your persistence and, and your energy. Um, it can be enervating after a while. But, but um, so, so first, first the, my, my last bullet, which I had to run through a little quickly, I was a little over time. Um, the core thing about this, I think, is what I said in that fourth bullet, which is embrace our humanity. Like, we, we do have to remember that we're, you know, we're dealing with other people in our families, we're dealing with other people in our communities. Um, that doesn't mean they're right but that does mean that we have to deal sympathetically and empathetically with them. Um, that's part of the answer, but it won't get you there, right? Um, sometimes deployment of more facts is not gonna actually make a difference. And in fact, I, I, would, I would posit that for those of you who worked in science policy, most of the time, deployment of new facts doesn't actually solve the problem. What does help sometimes is reframing what you're doing and reframing why you're doing it. And so I think thinking about the economic benefits, the positive future that we can embrace, you know, I, I, I don't want to overstretch the analogy, but who is really sorry that we don't have hundreds and hundreds of people in each agricultural field scything wheat every season to bring it in, right? We don't be bemoan the kind of transition that we've gone through because we, people can do other things more productively and they can do interesting things and they can, you know, have a better future in a way. So what we're talking about is reframing the issue, and maybe you could try that and Maybe you report back to us and let, let us know if it works. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Maeve Fiedenkopf. I'm also from Barnesville. My question is kind of similar to Skylar's in that you talked about um, a rapid transition in commodities like technology mm -hmm. and automobiles. But um, how do you propose to initiate such a rapid change um, for energy when like, a lot of people at the national level just refuse to acknowledge like, the existence of climate change? Yeah. Okay, good question. Um, <laughs> We're giving you the really yeah. easy By the way, I, I, <laughs> great for all you Brownstable guys, right? So this is, this is great, great questions. Um, is, is, yeah, and, and, and your teacher too. So, um, uh, yeah, let's. Um, um, so, so a couple answers, and I'll try to keep it short. You guys know I like to talk about this. So, so um, first is is sort of, Right now, the national level is, is tough, the next year to two years, right? We're just at a tough spot at the national level. We gotta think of, you know, gotta go to plan B right now, and that's what we're doing with America's Pledge. It's what you guys can do at Barnstable. It's what all of us can do in our own tidal pools, so to speak. Um, so that's one of the strategies. It turns out that that strategy builds the groundwork, right? Like if we're deploying stuff in our own, envir in our own spheres, it makes it easier for national reengagement down the road. So that's part of a, a kind of theory of the case here of how that, that, could be, uh, that could be helpful. But the other one is, frankly, back to our attitudes question. We have to recognize and realize, and your generation is going to be a key part of this, that we cannot burn all those fossil fuels. It just was not going to happen. It just cannot happen. Right? And I think we have to be more overt and more clear about the implications of what we're talking about so that we can start getting ourselves used to that in the very near term uh, so that when politics does end up starting to shift, it shifts in a, in a way that reflects that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Graciela. I'm from Barnstable High School too. And um, so you mentioned like initiatives that national like 
businesses and governments can take to make a change, but what can regular people do every day to make a change? Great question. Um, so it, again, it depends on what your what your what your sphere is. What po what choices do you have authority over, so to speak? So uh, you know you have the the usual things of like okay, well you can bike more if you have that option. Um, I, I, I'm people have to think carefully about this, and I'm not trying to put my my foot down really hard. But you can think about your diet. Think about changing. You know, reducing at least the amount of red meat that you eat, for example, is one way to do it that you can directly affect right now. Um, and then also. It is very important. Again, consumer choice is important. Like if, if you can get your parents to put in a, you know, a motion sensing thermostat or you know, buy an electric vehicle, then great and bless you. But also, elections matter, politics matters, organizing matters, and we have to, work, we have to use our institutions. We can't just do it with consumer choice. So do the consumer choice stuff and, and Godspeed on that, but also work in these other, in these other ways and, and work vigorously and and with great effort to, to make something happen. Thank you. Yeah. So my question, oh, I'm Rachel, by the way, also from Barnes to Ball. Um, right. My question coincides with that. Um, do you think that it's possible that doing consumer choice or a combination, because you said there are like four ways that you can go about it and combine together, that will reduce it by a lot. But say like policy doesn't end up swinging that way. Is it possible to reduce it the amount that we need to reduce it in 12 years without policy or something else? That is the undiscovered, right? So, so I, I, I don't, I actually, um, I, don't, I, usually, I don't like to say I don't think so, but I, I, I'll go back to like the second or third slide I did, which is that just incredibly rapid reduction. You know, the fact that we have to get rid of 70 or 80 percent of our coal-fired electricity by 2030 globally is, is, is such a, it's such a lift, and I, I, I don't want people to get the message. Sometimes, this is like the study of psychology of choice. Sometimes people feel like when the job is so big and so impossible, they just back away and they're like, you know, I'm out. Like, I just don't see why I can do anything. We're done. We are not done. We're half, you know, we're, we're crossing the bridge. We're, we're, we're part of it. You saw all those, you know, dropping costs, right? So don't, don't be discouraged. But on the other hand, it's, it's not gonna work without policy. Like it's gonna have to, we're gonna have to make some changes in politics to make this kind of thing work. And it's not just to kind of like impose a carbon tax, it's also to help with transition, right? Like there will be a lot of people that could be displaced by this rapid transition. And we need to think about, for example, that kind of transition and making sure that those people are, are kept on board. Hi, my name is Casey Brown. I'm also at Barnes School. Uh, I had two questions today. My first was, uh, I know that we rapidly have to change to more greener energies, but what do we do with the rest of the people that have built their lives and economy around you know, coal or natural gas or oil mining? Yeah. And my second is, um, I know that we have to make this change, but a lot of people won't change unless it's appealing. So how do you yeah. make you know, being more environmental more appealing? Yeah. So those are two brilliant observations and questions. And I, you know, by the way, all these Barnstable questions, all brilliant. So, so I, I just, this is a, is, is a wonderful set of, of questions you guys are bringing up um, and core to, to how we kind of think about this problem. Very briefly, the two, the two questions you raised, one was on the people that are affected and that's something in, you know, there is now a kind of emerging discussion around what people are now calling just transition. So thinking about um, those people who are affected and how you know, there is a kind of strategy so that people who are, say, 45 and trained for a certain kind of work might have options beyond just working in the coal industry, right? Um, so that's really important. If you have ideas and thoughts, apply your energy and thoughts to, to how to, to, to help, help us there. Um, and then the second piece was, what was the second one? Making it appealing. Making it appealing, right. So again, I had a slide at the end, which is sort of fast. But um, this is about a better... A, a, a set of better choices. And, and I don't know how many people have driven an electric vehicle versus driven like a regular vehicle. Uh, and I can say with confidence that electric vehicles are just better cars. They go faster, they're, they're, they, they steer better, there's less parts, like they're just better. And what we're talking about in the long run is choosing those kinds of better futures. And I think that remembering, I mean, a lot of my talk was about the imperative of doing it for, for this audience, but as you're sort of thinking about strategies and messaging and engaging, th those positive stories are, are, are key, so you're absolutely right. Thank you. 
uh, Ricardo Cortez, uh, my grandparent. Are you from Barnstable? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking about my grandchildren, but also the grandchildren in the world, because this yeah. is really about them and about you guys. Uh, based on, on the, the yes, yes We Can uh, graph that you have, I would like to suggest that one of the most important things perhaps was left out of that, and I think you just mentioned it briefly, but unless, unless we leave 80% of fossil fuels on the ground forever, regardless of what we do, we're still not going to be in good shape. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm Andrew Mead from Barnstable High School. Sorry, I'm the last one. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, uh, will climate change just slowly increment up, or will there be a drastic change that forces people to all see it at once and that they can't ignore it anymore? And that they'll have to do something yeah. about it. Great question, um, and one that scientists have been really struggling with. Uh, there's two elements of climate change. One is sort of gradual increase with gradual sort of increasing damages, and there's another dimension of sort of tipping points or extreme events, right, that get people to kind of wake up. We really hope we don't hit a major tipping point in the Earth system in the next you know, 25 or 50 years. Um, it's thought that the risk of that happening is relatively low compared to the things that we know more, uh, or we think are more likely, like just extreme heat events, flooding, uh, sea level rise, et cetera. But this is an area of, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on, on the science of climate change, ironically for this, uh, for, for this forum, but that is an area where people continue to be um, actively engaged and trying to understand. So that's an area, if you're interested, is, is uh, very important to, to contribute to. Um, but right now, I think it's important to remember, we are actually living it at the moment, right? There are these events that are unequivocally or pretty much obviously driven by climate change, um, and that those are part of what we're experiencing now. Those were the predictions that we had you know, 20 years ago the droughts, the floods, the fires, the intense hurricanes, et cetera, we are seeing the impacts of climate change today. So it's important when you, know, you are speaking with people about that to, to be aware that that's actually already affecting lives. Mm -hmm. Joe Solid again. Um, I would like to uh, turn to this question that was raised about communities of faith. Mm -hmm. um, it has been explained to me that there are people who see this uh, potential climate change apocalypse as aligned with what the, the future of humanity uh, is meant to be by God. And they talk about this as the rapture, that the world will collapse and the worthy will be sent up to heaven. These folks don't see a big incentive to stopping that from happening because they see themselves as worthy. Um, it's been described apparently as part of what goes on in Louisiana, where you see the oil companies destroying the bayous and you know, the, the death of the once highly valued natural environment there, and they accept this based on their beliefs. How do we deal with that? But uh, not just Louisiana. I mean, that is, yeah. this is a... Yeah. yeah no. uh, a lot, lot of different opinions in Louisiana. Yeah, I mean, look, I actually, don't have a great answer to that one either. Um, you know, there is a point where you do want to engage with people and uh, be kind of discussing in good faith. Um, on the other hand, um, it's also possible to make the numbers work on our side so that, you know, ultimately um, there might, ne some people might never be convinced, right? Like, and I think we have to kind of be aware in our social systems that we have to continue to kind of carry them along with us as we're trying to make these transitions and do so in as, as kind of uh, empathetic and uh, constructive ways we can. But there's a way in which, um, you know, partial, you know, engagement is good. I think there are people who are, you know, very much in this community of thinking about the overlap between ethics, values, faith, and, and our choices uh, in policy and environment and climate. And I, I wish them well. It's not something I directly do, but other people do it very eloquently. I think of for example, Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist, and you might want to look her up, um, does a lot of engagement like this uh, with, with different faith communities, and Christian faith communities particularly. So there are people like that who can be advocates, who can, who can sort of bring the message out. And I think the other part of it is just to continue to make that case that this is a positive future we're, we're choosing. It's not something that, um, uh, that should 
you know, necessarily lead to a, a worse outcome for those people um, uh, who are mm -hmm. perhaps not doing anything about it. Yeah. There are groups like Evangelicals for Climate Action, for instance, who are increasingly finding their voice. And I'm, I'll welcome now the last question in this Thank you. fabulous set of questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Lee Goodman, I'm a retired transportation engineer. I'd like to talk, I'm very much in favor of what we're going to do in the future. But what can we learn from the present that will help to change attitudes? I'd like to know if there's any mm -hmm. research going on or if we're checking into <clears throat> what's happening in Europe. My perception is that there are many countries in Europe which are way ahead of us in terms of renewable energy policies. France in particular, I think, has a tremendous percentage of its electricity generated by nuclear right now. Can we learn anything from them in terms of helping to accelerate the, the transition? Yeah. So it's a great point, and I have two quick answers to that. So first is absolutely yes. There are a number of countries, there's lots of experiments going on globally. You know, there's been a lot of leadership from different parts of the world in renewable deployment. We are kind of trying to learn from those. I think it's good to kind of cross-fertilize with ideas and policies and approaches that have worked in other places, mm -hmm. and also learn from what, what, what the failures were. Um, a, a second dimension of your question that I think we can potentially wrap on or leave off on, um, we talked earlier in the, in the day about the connections between some of the work that's being done in science and some work that's being done in, say, humanities or social science. We even kicked off the day with some art, uh, with the poetry, right? And I think that this is an area where you know, making those connections, thinking about what those other disciplines can bring to the table to help us understand how we have organized and how we successfully organize ourselves as human systems, right? Like as, as cultural, social people. Um, how do we organize ourselves? How do we motivate ourselves? How do we um, kind of collectively move in a certain direction? Um, that could, that's something that a lot of these other disciplines, I think, have a lot to say. And it was interesting in reading that IPCC report. Um, it was very clear there wasn't a lot of good uh, literature yet being brought to bear on that. So there's a lot of wide open areas for people to do research and new inquiry on and to keep this interdisciplinary conversation going. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.